the indicator sequence is the recurrence. Period. So, recurrence, reshmurance. Hello and thank you for watching my video. This is called Quadratic Polynomial Number Theorem and it is a generalization of Euler's Pentagonal Number Theorem and we'll see what that means for known results and we'll look at some new things too. And uh, this is a submission to three blue, one brown's uh, Summer of Math Exposition 1, S-O-M-E-1, thanks Grant, this guy, and gang for inviting me. For this final episode, I'm going to walk you through this paper, which is a paper in progress. There's going to be plenty of mistakes. I've got notes to myself on things I need to investigate and research. There are some things that are old ideas that are coming out or need revision. Um, so please, please uh, take it for what it's worth. Well, let's just see what it says here in this here paper. Up to now, we have covered that this quadratic of Euler's pentagonal number theorem can be replaced by this general quadratic f alpha beta of k in the theory of partitions and get analogous generating functions, Euler type occurrences and identities, and restricted partition functions and restricted sum of divisors functions all over these two parameters alpha beta, a complete generalization. And now we are at the point where we're going to introduce some consequences. Euler's pentagonal number theorem, the Q series, and the quadratic of the generalized pentagonal numbers, the sequence of it. The generalized quadratic and the sequence value representation defined I did not note this in the original episode, but fixing alpha equals 1 fixes the whole generalization to the cases where these corresponding quadratics are the ones that give the g-gonal numbers for pentagonal and greater. When we get to square numbers, that's excluded for the time being. The mod notation that I use the latex macros that I use require these packages. These are the macros for the latex display. Here are some factoids about the alpha beta quadratic. Obligatory blah blah blah. Notations defining the alpha beta generalized partition and sigma sum of divisors functions and a foreshadowing of over partitions. I will be going into extensive detail on these bits shortly. More foreshadowing to summarize the introduction. Quadratic polynomial number theorem. Proof via Ramanujan's tau function, essentially. Euler wasn't happy with just that, and neither should we be. Fortunately, we have Jacobi's triple product identity, which is kind of like a Swiss Army knife. We can narrow that down to two special cases uh, covered by Hardy and Wright in their book, and narrowing down further, we find our generalization embedded within 
Time to wave those hands. But yeah, really know there's something going on here. Definitions. Definitions continued and a note to myself. I'm developing shorthand notation. More notations, definitions, etc. It's all the general theory of partitions and recurrences and identities. Most of them are going to be the first fruits of that are really just going to be corollaries. Generating functions, recurrences. Ho Han Lung detailed the uh, alpha equals one case, aka the uh, gigonal case, in a in a relatively recent paper, and that's the only reference uh, that comes close to the generalization that I could find. As for over partitions, let's take a closer look. Starting with our expression for unrestricted partitions, this is easily split into three uh, product components within our generalization. We have these are not equivalent. I'm just saying what uh, unless alpha is one and beta equals two, then we get this equivalence here uh, because zero, one, and two are mutually exclusive, and uh, every integer is equivalent to either zero, one, or two. Mod three, uh, and that's it. So once you go to a beta greater than two, alpha greater than one, then uh, we're looking at a. Uh, a restricted set, smaller, smaller uh, number of terms than this. Let's just call it P. This is just a uh, just a bold single letter, no index or anything, just to sort of indicate the you know, product form, the generating function. You could also designate this as a sequence, with the understanding that sequences are multiplied out infinitely, etc. Anyway, once we do this, uh, now we can uh, employ the trick of, of changing our exponent on Q so that our index on K can be the, the whole deal from 1 to infinity. And uh, this first term uh, then becomes 1 over 1 minus Q to the alpha plus beta k minus beta. So that when k equals 1, we have alpha beta minus beta giving us alpha. When k equals 2, we have 2 alpha plus 2 beta minus beta giving us 2 alpha plus beta. Subtract, or take out the alpha beta by the mod operation, we're left with the alpha. So this will restrict to just the uh, exponents that are alpha mod alpha plus beta. Similarly, we will then have 1 over 1 minus q to the alpha plus beta times k minus alpha. That's going to give us our beta terms. And then finally, 1 minus q to the alpha plus beta k. We're going to give us our 0 mod alpha beta terms. When alpha equals 1, and beta equals 2, then we have unrestricted partitions. For values greater than 1, 2 for alpha and beta, we then get restricted partitions. Okay, so what if we go down? Well, the only place to go down uh, immediately, uh, uh, sensibly, is alpha equals 1, beta equals 1. So alpha equals beta equals 1, which all we have to do is that becomes 2k minus 1, 2k minus 1, and 2k. So k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over 1 minus q to the 2k minus 1 squared times 1 over 1 minus q to 2k. And if we we're thinking in terms of our, 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 our funny symbols here, notice that this is partitions into odd parts, and this is partitions into even parts, and that's squared. So 
sequence or generating function wise, this is also equivalent to P O squared dot P E. Then take one of these and this one and mend it to, to, uh, to be a single thing over the full index. Which we did backwards before, but now we're doing in this direction. And we get 1 over 1 minus Q to the 2K minus 1 dot 1 over 1 minus Q to the K. And that is a PO, and that's unrestricted. So then using our PO and PD um, equivalents, this can then also simply be written 1 plus Q to the K in lieu of this over 1 minus Q to the K. So when we first derive that, we're like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. We've got basically PD times P. Um, and then as it turns out, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about over partitions. So, so we've just found it uh, organically uh, from the uh, generalization uh, before we even knew uh, what it was. By what we did generalizing this to alpha and beta, we can see that this one's going to generalize in exactly the same way. Um, it's just going to have this additional term here. So um, we have, well, let me write it out. When we look at what happens when alpha equals 1, beta equals 2, that should be our base case of over partitions. And so essentially, So we've got, well, we're going to call that PO, and this one, uh, and that's PO squared, that's PDE squared, that's PE, and that's PDE, meaning I messed up on this one, that is PDO. So PO squared times PDO squared times PE times PDE is, and of course it's not because I jumped the shark, and I did not do alpha equals 1 beta equals 2 here. I did the over over partitions that we're going to get. Let's go back and, 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 and do the alpha equals 1 beta equals 2 just for, uh, just to cover the ground. Okay, this is more like it. So starting with this form, and alpha equals 1, beta equals 2, here we're going to get 3k minus 2, here we're going to get 3k minus 1, and here we're going to get 3k. It's not hard to see that this covers all positive integers, so this is over partitions, k equals 1 to infinity of 1 plus q to the k over 1 minus q to the k. Coming back to this, where we accidentally put in alpha uh, equals 1, beta equals 1, we turned over partitions into two over partitions. Um, so, let's see what we got. One, two lines there. This is actually single line 1 1 of n equals double line of n and then from there then we can generalize to alpha beta n and then from there we can take alpha equals 1 beta equals 1 and, and go to 3 over partitions etc. This is not an error I don't believe uh, from when we started this derivation so Maybe let's get caught up a little bit here. We've got, and since uh, p over partitions is p d dot p, we could even we could write this as p as as over partitions dot 
P D dot P D O. So obviously there's a lot of a lot of ways we can do this and things start to grow and uh, get complicated uh, but that gives us uh, opportunities as well. But what I want to point out here is um, going back to this form here notice that if this were K and not 2K that this would be basically over partitions 1 plus Q to the K over 1 minus Q to the K and similarly here if these exponents were not 2k minus 1 but k, we would have over partitions squared. So we can intuit that these are odd over partitions squared and that these are even over partitions. So that another expression here would be p o odd over partitions squared dot even over partitions. To be clear, I'm talking about over partitions into odd parts and over partitions into even parts. What we have here is basically imagine we have an infinite plane, and this is and this is and this is alpha beta. You know, this is alpha beta, and this is n equals one. Well, then we can imagine then we can have n equals two, n equals three, etc. And so there's a uh, uh, so we can think of this as a domain in n three uh, as uh, three uh, independent parameters where alpha is greater than zero, beta is greater than alpha, and, and n is greater than zero. So over all those integers we have this domain. Well the thing is, and this is Pn, because alpha equals one, beta, alpha equals one, beta equals one is outside of our domain, we've gone somewhere else. Where have we gone? Well we've gone to over partitions, we know that much. What does that mean? Well, it could mean a lot of things, but the, the thing that the take home is is that for over partitions, we can imagine we have this infinite plane. We have alpha and beta, and we say that this is n equals 1, and then we can have n equals 2. And on up, we can have n equals 2. And on up. And so this is exactly the same domain. And so we have this clear isomorphism and if we wanted to we could expand the generalization alpha beta n and then d for example degree uh, something like that uh, so so we can think of this as a degree one this is a as a degree two or a degree zero degree one we're gonna let the how the numbers shake out uh, determine what's the best way What's the best approach on that? Because it's not not an integer, not necessarily an integer degree. But the important point is is that this notion is going to carry through. That uh, two over partitions, three over partitions, four over partitions, etc., are all going. All of these functions are going to share this 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 uh, n three domain. Okay, over partitions, um, the uh, common definition. These things were studied, by, uh, this form was studied by McMahon, as early as McMahon, uh, and nothing much happened. But uh, early 2000s, Cortiel and Lovejoy wrote a paper on over partitions. They actually dubbed the term over partitions in that paper. Um, and uh, there's been uh, uh, a lot of renewed interest since then. Uh, but anyway, Cortiel and Lovejoy, they describe, they give a definition of over partitions, which seems to have propagated through all of these more recent papers. And that is to say, given a, uh, given some partition of uh, n, uh, and let's just say it's, uh, let's just say it's 7665444321. And let's just say that's the partition. And their definition is that over partitions are counting the partitions and then plus counting each part where the first occurrence of each part may be overlined. 
what they're saying is, is that we start with our partition, then we can have a partition where 7 is overlined, bop, 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 and everything else stays the same. And then we can have a partition where the f one of the six is overlined, and bop, 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 everything stays the same. Overlined, dot, dot, dot. Easier to see with a smaller example, but very easy to see with a larger example that this gets pretty messy. Every combination of which, the, you know, on these, just one, the first occurrence of any given lambda, a uh, distinct lambda, distinct partition part, that we're going to get all these combinations of, of which ones are overlined and which ones aren't overlined. I have a better way, and it, it might be the key to, to finding a combinor, the combinatorial explanation for two over partitions and beyond, hopefully. Start by first breaking this down into into what it is, which is um, just a, a play on the distinct parts within the partition. So uh, this partition has distinct parts seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We're not considering the the partitions into distinct parts. We're we're con still considering this partition, but we're just focusing on on just distinct uh, lambda. In the essence of this. Is, is that I'm going to have 7 by itself, then 7 with 6, then 7 with five, seven with each of these by themselves, so I'm going, to have a I'm going to have a series of doubles, then I'm going to have a series of triples, and then I'm going to have a series of quadruples, etc. And it's all the same thing. This is just, because this is a set, not a multi-set, uh, all the elements are different, all we're talking about is the, say this di, of n is the number of distinct parts in a partition. So di of this partition is of pi i. Oh, this partition is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Which means, because this is a set, not a multi-set, when we do this, we're doing the same thing as, as, um, as taking all of the subsets of this, basically, and counting those. So that is uh, not even a sum because we're talking about a single partition. It's two to the di. Period. So we can say that p of n, the over partitions of n, equals the sum. I'm going to say j here equals one to p of n, just the regular partitions of n. 2 to the di of j. So for each partition of n, we're adding 2 to the di of j, where di is the number of distinct parts within that partition. And that's it. Or equivalently, we can state that over partitions of n are the number of k subsets of, of the set of the distinct parts of every partition of n. k subsets just refers to all the, all the possible subsets of a set. A set has no repeated elements, so if we have a set a, b, c, we say that this is the, we, we can say this is the three subset, this, this is a three subset, meaning there's three elements, and there is only one. In terms of two subsets, we have A, B, A, C, and B, C, we have three, two subsets, and for one then it's just, it's just, we have three, A, and B, and C, and uh, for one, we have uh, the empty set. So three, two, I mean zero. Three, two, one, and we also count the zeroth, the zeroth subset, when k equals zero, k subset. Um, so, 
Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And of course, these are just uh, go by the binomial coefficients. One, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one, which always sum to two to the d, whatever uh, degree we're talking about here. Basically, Pascal's triangle. These are going to sum to two. These are going to sum to two to the two equals four. These are going to sum to two to the three equals five. I mean, equals eight. Two to the three equals eight. And we think that, and I, I don't know, but it seems very logical to pursue a combinatorial explanation for the moreover partitions in terms of something like this. Okay, some very broad takeaways. Well, the first is, is that the inverse of a partition function sequence, the inverse of that sequence, is better um, described, I, I don't want to say better described, but the reason I say indicator is like, I can have a sequence and I can take the inverse, I can say that's the inverse of the sequence, but, I, but, I, but what if my sequence was one of these indicators, the inverse is now the partition function. So, so rather than the, these disembodied sequences, I think that the point is, is that it's, this is a symbiotic thing. This is the, the, the partition sequence and the, uh, the indicator sequence. That there is, you perturb one side in the slightest, the other side changes. So this is uh, isomorphic and unique, and et cetera, like that. So the idea is, is to think in terms of, to think in terms of the, um, you know, the, the outverse, partitions and the inverse indicator to think of this as a single object to think of this as a single object because because that's because there's no reason not to because there's no reason not to um, and the other thing about that is uh, two and it kind of supports the same thing um, is that what we've got is, uh, all right, let's say this is our P sequence. And this is our I sequence. Um, and we saw before that the I sequence is made up of these, of these uh, Mobius, what we can call it the, the sum Mobius bits. And obviously it's only when we're dealing with the inverse of the primordial or the primordial, I should say, which is the inverse or indicator of partitions into parts into primes, that, uh, but the same principles apply, that we're talking about how many times do the numbers in the sequence sum to give other numbers in the sequence, essentially. We can think of these as particles, uh, if you will. When we take the inverse of that, those same particles then gives us the gives us everything, counts everything that uh, can be made from those particles in, in whatever combination. It, it, and it's, it, it's kind of, it's sort of like that. Related is the following notion, which I'm going to say tongue-in-cheek is recurrences, reshmurrences. Because if you have a partition function sequence that is uh, at least restricted, and probably uh, this applies in general, or there are general principles to be found here, but at least for the restricted case, when we have restricted partitions, I mean, it, it actually works for over partitions, so that it's much broader than that. The general idea is, and, and where this is true or where this might fail, that all needs to be explored. But essentially, for most cases, for most of our basic cases here, we have partitions of some character, characterization, and we want to find a recurrence that gives us, that allows us to generate this sequence. We don't have to scratch our heads too hard. All we have to do 
is take the inverse of this. The indicator sequence is the recurrence. Period. So, recurrence, reschmerence. Okay, yeah, going back to this example. This was our primorial, quintuple primorial, with uh, the factor of 2 included. And from that, we got accurate sequ sequence elements up to this. So let's write that backwards and change this, uh, the sign of these, because when we do the recurrence, we move them to the other side of the uh, equivalence. So we can say, if we're going to write this backwards, 1 and change the sign, 0. When we invert that, that's what we get, which is going to be the sequence of partitions into prime parts. If we say that P uh, into partitions into prime parts of 0 is 1, by definition, then we have 1, 1, we're going to get 0. 2, we're going to get, we're going to add 1, 1. For 3, I wrote that out wrong. There's a zero there before that, before another negative one. We know there's a negative one out here that's missing. So this is as far as we go for nine. We're going to get zero, three, five, negative one, and that's a one. So five minus one is going to give us four. And it's not so uh, hard to see, but that we are getting uh, this uh, sequence duplicated. That's our that's our recurrence. If we say p star for primes into primes of n, well, we can we can write it out as p star of n one two of n minus two plus p star of n minus three. That's one two three four five six seven eight. Minus p star of n minus 8, minus p star of n minus 9, etc., etc. So there's your recurrence for partitions into prime parts. Easy as pi to generate a recurrence. It may not be so easy to codify these uh, numbers to give a compact form. But in terms of when somebody says, hey, I found a recurrence for these partitions, then, yeah, okay, yeah, um, we believe you. It should be very, very, very easy to prove. And I don't think that a lot of folks realize this, that this, um, there's a, a holistic kind of uh, view here that uh, gives insight and sheds light on, on, on what this whole video is all about. So, And four, it is not about partitions or distinct partitions and their subsets or restricted siblings and their subsets or restricted siblings, or how they are overcounted. Rather, it is appearing to be useful to think in terms of M over partitions. Sum of K equals 1 to infinity of 1 plus Q to the M1 over 1 minus Q to the M2. M doesn't have to be an integer. M can go, other, M can be rational or real uh, or complex. And these things are, are, are like numerator and denominator. It's about this ratio. Everything's about this ratio, not the components of this ratio. And, uh, you know, so these are the base cases uh, at a, a degree zero, or perhaps uh, the ratio is one at this point. Uh, it's 
there's a uh, there's a richness here uh, uh, beyond what what we've seen in partitions uh, so far. Recall from the special episode we had uh, for the odd primordial sequence, and then when that when we took this and we multiplied it by negative one, and then uh, shifted it forward to uh, and then summed it up, that we got the indicator sequence for partitions into primes and that the distinct um, sums, the uh, number of ways that k or n can be summed by distinct primes is given by the, by the absolute value in, in this sequence. Which is very interesting because when you take just the absolute values from this in this the, given in this indicator sequence, the in this inverse, you get restricted partition numbers. Uh, these are one zero zero one zero one zero one one. This is the number of partitions of n into distinct odd primes. So this, as a ratio, is. Hmm, I don't want to say an origin. I think a balancing point is probably the best way to describe it. Let's see if I can describe it with math. All right, so thinking in terms of this m over partitions, we can think of it as a ratio of these two, but it's also, I mean, it's a, you know, it looks like a product when expressed this way. Uh, so to maintain that ratio form, then it's this is distinct partitions over uh, the indicator of unrestricted partitions, where uh, these m1 and m2, in this case, are taking on the values of all natural numbers. Similar to what we did with the primordial, let's look at these, this indicator sequence for partitions, which is just our good old generalized pentagonal numbers indicator sequence, and let's divide it by 2, by 1, 0, negative 1, and let's see what we get. Yeah, so I uh, made I did make a mistake. I'm not even sure if this is right. I'm sure that it might be. Probably is, but uh, but the point is is that if we do this similar to what we did with the uh, primordial example, and we take the absolute value of this, are we getting a corresponding? This is an indicator sequence. Um, that's been divided out by two, but so, but otherwise, uh, on the inverse side of things, but the absolute value de alternate the thing, and are are these numbers that were given then corresponding to some uh, restricted or over partition? And I think the answer is yes in every case, just very similar to the recurrences, reshmerances argument. Um, and that, that primordial example is key, uh, and in integers is key, but we can kind of see where they're both doing the same thing. So, uh, uh you know, this is, wow, uh, this is, you know, this is just begging for, uh, this is just begging for some, some hardcore research. And, and the holy grail is, I mean, let's just start with divisors of n, and we'll put in this uh, little delta sign of d of the divisor equals omega, small omega n, the number of prime factors of n, where this delta p is just a, uh, or delta, well delta p of d is just an indicator that's 1 when d is prime and it's zero otherwise. So, uh, and from this then we have the Mobius inversion formula which is D dividing N mu Mobius, Mobius of D and this is a regular um, omega of N over D which is just another divisor uh, equals P of n, delta P of n. And what all of this is suggesting, I don't know if you can see it, I can see it, and uh, the 
this is why I'm compelled to explore it, that because of this action where we are reproducing, in the primordial case, the Mobius function proper in a sum form, and the absolute values of these being analogous in some capacity to, you know, to restricted or over partitions uh, into distinct parts. And um, so that this, that this relation and how it all works over the, your choices of M1 and M2, that it's more or less universal and we have looming a very broad generalization of the Mobius function to, uh, to everything. I think that's what we're looking at. And then with the transform of the uh, inversion formula, uh, that the transform of the inversion formula is, is the same darn thing. It's, that's what we're talking about. Partitions, uh, the, the, the partition, the indicator, the ratio, uh, the connection to the Mobius function where we can translate from the product form to the sum form of the Mobius function. I think the Mobius function is generalizable in this in in to unlock this and in that in that yeah uh all right so that is way hand wavy but for a good reason and i hope that you can see it that this relationship is the mobius transform partitions inverse indicator Mobius inversion. Uh, with that, just a couple more things uh, that I promised in the title card, and that would be these number triangles and affairs diagram. We're going to cover those quickly. And it all also implies another new concept over divisors. In a very recent paper, Da Silva and Sakai found the recurrence for over partitions. Of course, we can get that same recurrence as a corollary of the generalization, or by taking the inverse of the sequence of over partitions, perhaps. Yeah, we could do that too. Statement and proof of the summation formula for the number of over partitions as a uh, alternate to counting parts that may be overlined. Notes on more over partitions. Note to myself, I don't think I covered this one. It's a really nice form for uh, uh, for two over partitions, but uh, three over partitions, it's not as pretty. We can calculate more over partitions to the moon, but I think it has to start with understanding the combinatorial uh, structure, because it, it could be because we have the set and then the multi-set and then some kind of multi-set of the multi-set. We could be talking about levels of a left in here or a structure to an left structure if it's a death spiral of useless abstraction we sort of want to know that before we enter here i describe how this compound farer's diagram type notation for alpha beta generalized partitions how it all works i put it together uh, with these latex macros here uh, and if you want to or if you need to screw any of them up, just change one thing. Here's an example. I'm attempting to describe the Ferrer's diagram in terms or in context of the uh, uh, analogous Franklin type combinatorial proof. And uh, so that's what this is about and needs work or it needs to come out, but uh, or needs a new context. All right. So the idea behind these bits is to take known identities that are uh, that operate on modular criteria and convert them into uh, alpha beta language uh, or into the alpha beta framework to see what they look like and how they compare to each other there. I mean, the Roger, Rogers Ramanujan identities is probably where we start, uh, but and there's going to be tons of them, tons of them that, that, that we can work with. And here are the referenced 
uh, fair type diagram tables. And here's your homework. This here is Pascal's triangle, the uh, rows sum to the powers of two. And if we take that sequence, that those lines, which we say is a slope of one, two, alpha equals one, beta equals two, in case you're wondering, uh, we get the Fibonacci numbers, which if you look at it, look what it is. It's just the first two entries of the recurrence for partitions. And I am most happy to present to the world the partnomial coefficients triangle. This is a bijection to Pascal's triangle, and the rows sum to the over partitions, and the same slope of 1, 2 uh, applied here then gives us a sum to the partitions of n. So uh, homework assignment number one, where did we get that? How did that come out of the soup? And uh, also, what happens when we assign different alpha beta values and the slope changes? What do we get sums to? This is um, just a remarkable mathematical object, all uh, as remarkable as uh, Pascal's triangle itself because when we biject back and take those same alpha beta partitions with their given slopes and we apply it to Pascal's triangle we get general alpha beta generalized Fibonacci numbers it's it's a uh, very beautiful and very incredible um, just some notes here note that the uh, s since the sum of each row of the partitions of the over partitions the sum of, since the sum of each row is the over partitions the totals from row to row are going to follow that recurrence that we had except rather than working on singular numbers the recurrence will be working on a distribution which then has an associated offset that changes and stuff as you go so anyway that's the homework how is all of this done where did the partnomial coefficient triangle come from and what is it good for? If you can figure these things out, then you are a partitions researcher. And then it gets hairier. There's a, an additional symmetry in this uh, one here. Here are some samples of what you're going to find. And here are references that I've uh, got typeset. Um, um, some of them, uh, there's more I need to put in, and maybe some of these will go away. I don't know. I uh, am grateful to uh, the Summer of Math Exposition uh, project and the idea of it that uh, uh, here's a place where we can informally uh, share uh, mathematical uh, uh, you know, teachings and information and, uh, and research uh, in a less formal environment without, uh, you know, a bunch of poppycocking and hogwashing. And so I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to uh, uh, show what I've got going on. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for watching my video.